talk of the Sitara Technology and Development Seminar Series. The title of today's talk is Matu Marvel, Addressing Affordable Housing, Bhutman and Kaulan. So today we have Dr. Yas Kul Shresh with us. Dr. Yas Kul Shresh is an entrepreneur and consultant working at the intersection of mud construction, bio-based materials, industrial design and science communication. He earned his PhD from Delft University of Technology, TU Delft, the Netherlands, in 2022 on the topic Building Affordable, Durable and Desirable Urban Homes. Throughout his career, Yask has been recognized for his innovative work. He has been a Delft Global and KVPY Fellow and is recently awarded the WDCD Make, uh, Make Circular Challenge for developing the pool brick, a cow duck stabilized mud block. Additionally, he has received various grants such as the RVO scale up funding for startup, NW8 idea generator for postdoc, Dell's Global uh, Fellowship for PhD, and Spark International Staff Exchange Fund. Yask enjoys traveling and has a particular fondness for deserts. Currently, he resides in Goa, where he continues to pursue his passion in research, education, and science communication. Welcome over to you. Thank you everyone for attending this uh, seminar. Uh, as my introduction is already given, I would still say something about me. Actually, I was born in Nepal and uh, because my father was working in Ketra Vidyalaya there and then I changed uh, three or four schools uh, before finishing high school and then I did my bachelor's from Gujarat, uh, it's college called BB and Engineering College. Okay, so yeah, so finished my bachelor's in civil engineering in 2012 and then uh, after every degree I have sort of a gap year or a year where I explore. So after that I went for my master's, finished in 2015, worked as a RA for uh, roughly a year and then did one of the best things according to me in my life is to take uh, 9 months uh, off and travel throughout the country. So nine months of continuous backpacking trip throughout the country, which actually helped me write the proposal that became my PhD topic. And uh, yeah, started in 2017. And as mentioned, last year I graduated or finished my PhD. Also at the same time, I co-founded uh, the company called Cool Bricks. Uh, uh, you will get to hear about it uh, as well. And before I did it, I will start my job. And uh, I also left that company in a year and then uh, started another company called Murder Studio. And I'm also working on a bunch of, bunch of other things. If we have time, I will talk about it. Okay. This is Manhattan. We all know Manhattan for its high rise buildings, for use of fire bricks, concrete, and glass. Uh, for cooling and heating, there is a requirement of Lord Venage, right? But not many people know about Manhattan of Desert, which is uh, in Shabam, Yemen. This place or this city has mud houses which are up to 8 story high. They use soil uh, or these are built from soil which was available locally and people are still living in these houses for the last 400 years and it has survived all the weather in the last 400 years. There are other examples of mud houses as well. Like we all know uh, Great Wall of China. Actually the core of Great Wall of China in certain part is made up of rammed earth or rammed mud and later cladded with stone. And as you can see this structure is there and this is a particular part in the desert area and it has survived well. Some I would say recent uh, houses uh, which where people are still living. This one is the house Pueblo in New Mexico. This one is in China. Uh, again, uh, roughly 800 people, 400 to 800 people live in these kind of mud housing complexes. This is a recent example. Uh, within last 10 years, uh, this is an example of a factory made in Switzerland from earth or mud. And this is an example of a building which is in the center of city of Lyon. 
So, for the last 10,000 years, we are building with mud and uh, over time, uh, people kind of forgot this technology, but there is revival of building with mud. And 10% uh, of the population in the world still live in mud houses. And this proportion or this percentage is almost double in countries or middle, low and middle income countries like India. So roughly 20% people still live in mud houses. I will give you a very brief overview of what is mud construction so that uh, you know, we are aligned. Uh, mud construction, the most simple example is uh, sand castle. Uh, sand castle is a simple example of mud construction and it's the water. Uh, which creates capillary suction and uh, which holds the structure together. It's very weak because you can just break it with your hand and also it is not durable, like once the tide comes, it's gone. So, low strength and low durability. But you add clay into it and then you can make bigger castles, like this one. So, in this case, clay acts as a binder and improve the strength and water resistance of uh, mud or soil and when I, you can see that I am sometimes using word mud, sometimes earth, sometimes soil these all mean, mean the same thing basically the soil which you find outside it's the same thing it's just different names given to it so when I use mud or earth I am talking about the same thing how to make a mud block or mud, mud, uh, mud based or uh, earthen material is very simple mix water with soil then you will have a moist mix which you have to shape and you can give it any shape and then eventually dry it on uh, but at room temperature or under sun so that's the difference as compared to pile bricks which is needed at high temperature this is like just a uh, drying in sun or uh, inside a room and the shaping part is important because the shaping actually gives something called earthen construction techniques there are many of these techniques Maybe you know some of these. Adobe is a popular earth construction technique, which is handmade blocks. Uh, there is rammed earth, uh, which is which I showed example of Great Wall of China, where uh, they have used a mechanical compactor to ram it. Uh, there are modern techniques as uh, compressed earth blocks, uh, which use uh, mechanical machines to uh, compress these blocks. And the recent ones are 3D printing, and many companies and universities are working on 3D printing of mud. Uh, for mud construction, it always starts with selection of soil. Uh, soil is basically different uh, gray, uh, particle sizes. As you can see on this slide, uh, it's uh, clay, silt, sand and gravel. These are just different particle sizes and a soil is composed of mixture of these. Uh, what you see in this uh, clay, silt and sand tab is the range, permissible range. So if I am selecting a soil, and my clay, silt and sand content which I can find through experiment falls within this range I am almost good to go uh, and use this soil for construction and these are not like arbitrary values these are taken from different building codes so in some countries there are also building codes uh, to uh, help in construction with mud but there is a problem Mud is not very durable. If you take soil, compress it into a small block and throw it in water, it will not stay in water. Uh, and soil, all the places where you go, maybe the soil is not really good for construction, so you have to improve it. So there are three methods to improve it. First is physical, where you add some clay or some sand. So basically change those ratios between sand, clay and sand. Second is mechanical, just give them some force. So shaping is the process in that way. If you have more heavy ramming or heavy hammer compacting the soil then it will be much more denser and stronger. Third one is chemical which is the most used one. You add some cement or lime which is generally 5 to 10 percent and then it obviously improves the water resistance and strength. So building with mud has quite some benefit. One is it is locally available. Uh, obviously it's cheap uh, as long as you are not transporting it from long distances. It's eco-friendly. Uh, it's reusable so you can just reuse the material again and again and maybe you have heard of this thing that mud houses keep uh, like, or uh, indoor climate it's cool in summer and warm in winter so that's one important property because then you save electricity bill and you don't need to have ACs in general 
If there are so many good properties in mud, can it be used for making houses, especially when there is a global housing shortage? Can we use this material to build <coughs> that gap? That's one important question. And this is much more important for the context of India, where 64% of the population still lives in rural areas and contributes to 46% of national income. Also in 2022, there was a gap of 16 million houses. So there is need of a lot of houses. We have short time. And government also gives a financial assistance of 1.2 lakhs rupees, uh, which is not sufficient, uh, especially when you want to build with fired bricks or cement because these materials, the prices are increasing and it's disproportionate to rise in income. So these materials are getting more expensive with rising fuel costs, wars and all, they all contribute to the rise of this material. So let's look at mud houses in India. This is a trend based on census uh, survey of India and you can see in the case of mud, it's, uh, it's declining. It's declining very fast. That means uh, people probably don't want to live in mud houses. And that's why it, uh, uh, it gave us a question that can mud houses provide a sustainable solution to housing shortage in India? So can it really solve the problem or the declining trend says that uh, the, mud, the days for mud construction are gone? So to answer this question, I traveled for 9 months which I mentioned before, but this time 9 plus 3, so a whole year. Uh, and I visited different places, spoke to different people uh, on a very positive note. I didn't have an agenda before going to these uh, places. I was just free, had nothing to do and I wanted to make a documentary on mud houses back then which I never finished but, but it resulted into a thesis and some articles as well. So I spoke to different people uh, and uh, it was a very great journey. And I actually volunteered in mud house projects and in some places I also lived for two weeks which you cannot do in a normal research scenario. Showing you some examples of mud houses uh, throughout the India which I visited. I will just, uh, just scan over it. Uh, there are different types of techniques used in different parts of India. Uh, this one is in Tiruvanna Malai. Uh, it uses a technique which was not shown there, which is earth bag, where you put soil in a in a bag, like a, a jute bag, and then stack it over to make a house. There are also, say, modern earth construction like this, which you cannot recognize. Is it fire brick or is it mud? But this is mud, and in this structure, which is in uh, Pondicherry, they have used uh, cement to make it more stable. Uh, this is also a modern earth house. Uh, we call these modern earth houses which uses some sort of a stabilization, especially cement or lime and also look modern by the way. So this is an example of a really good mud house which uh, according to me it's very very uh, like it's very beautiful and uh, yeah, uh, a people, it attracts people uh, in the surrounding. But there is a problem. Earth buildings uh, mud buildings are not always durable. Maybe when you have been to a rural area, you might have seen some structures which are deteriorating because if you don't take proper care of these structures, they start uh, disintegrating. So, they are not durable. And this picture sums up what is happening. Where people who are living in mud houses don't want mud houses anymore and they are shifting towards concrete house. I am going to show you two interviews which I just recorded during that travel which will give you some
and talking about image i will take a very small detour about a images because what i did yesterday to create a slide picture i gave a prompt to create mud houses i gave all the prompts like modern art house red roof and all those things but still you see all the mud houses you see are the traditional ones which are in your memory so the problem of image and acceptance is much more deep rooted it's not uh, like only limited to some people it's it's in the whole system and when i really forced it to make something with flat roof it came up with this which does not even look like a modern mud house uh, so yeah so it was quite interesting that these kind of uh, perceptions image issues all the understanding of these materials are like uh, skewed everywhere so coming back to the uh, research uh, as you can see image or acceptance is a major barrier for for making houses with this material and that's why i selected three key uh, i would say variables or three key topics to address one is desirability and this desirability to make something desirable especially mud house depends on durability uh, they are less desirable because they are low durable and if i want to make something desirable and durable and by durable i means water resistance you can just see so very much related to water resistance so if i can make something desirable and water resistance i still have to make it affordable so that people can afford it especially low income households so basically uh, to improve its performance uh, as i mentioned people like cement lime and lutein these these are some of the materials which is added to mud to make it more strong durable but we wanted to choose something which is safe uh, and which is some which is available and also acceptable and that's cowden so i will talk about cowden as a stabilizer i did quite some experiments on this topic uh, it's one of my chapters of the thesis but also the main result of my thesis work why cowden because it's available it's suitable for indian context it's available it has been used as a plastering material for my walls for many many years interestingly it is the least studied stabilizer which is used in practice you can just count handful of articles you will find on it and also there is no study on the water resistance of cowden even though it is used as a water resistant coating so so quite interesting material to study well then Uh, i won't go into depth of this but just want to indicate it's not that the uh, i did the experiments on all the results were really great it's a process of iteration so we started with some things because it's a new material i don't know much about it i did some small experiments to see how it behaves i learned from it and in the next set of iteration i improved my own experimentation and my whole testing setup and that's why eventually i came to a stage where i could make like over 300 samples and test them luck plays a very big factor in this case because october 19 and i think march 20 these are the years uh, the lab closed down because of covid which gave me extra time and i could see some samples how they behave over a period of 2 3 weeks which i would have not done because you know the lab was open i would have used those samples but eventually found out that covid was quite lucky for me because i got to know more about this material uh cowden i did my research even though my research is in indian context i did it in netherlands uh, mainly because of the equipment and the facilities available so we collected cowden from a local farm you can see that uh, there are, these are the characteristics of the farm but uh, interesting thing is that it's semi automated so there was kind of consistency in uh the collection of or the kind of consistency in food which was given to the cows so it was more or less quite consistent although it changes through the seasons but still the same food and they could store a lot of cow dung which we could use for our research this is me collecting cow dung if you can see on the right hand side uh, the cow dung in netherlands is much more wet then the cow dung you see here it's actually mixed with little bit water but also these cows are given food so that they can grow much faster and that creates a situation of sort of diarrhea where they where the cow dung is much more wetter than it not normally should uh, this is my supervisor as well collecting cow pee uh, for research so it was always him who used to drive us around 
and uh, like uh, actually we all, always we collected cow dung mainly from this farm but we had to do it so many times. The cow dung collected there it has a solid content of 9 to 12 percent everything else is liquid or water so very less solid uh, in this cow dung which we collected. And because I want to make samples, I want to make block, we decided to fix 2% of cowden as a stabilizer in the soil. Which means, when I will add my liquid cowden with soil, it should result into a block which will eventually have only 2% of dry cowden. Uh, this is a sample preparation, very simple two components, soil plus cowden, wet cowden and then uh, compressing it in a setup and I will show you the setup because this is a setup I created specifically for this uh, for my blocks our lab was dealing with concrete and cement block which is different materials these blocks are very soft so you have to come up with a different way of making these and I will just show you a video very quickly about how I made the samples control the amount of force and uh, to tell you uh, this, the samples had a difference of a 0 0.02 grams or something like that. They were very precise. All the samples have the same weight as well. And you don't need any oil or anything to remove the material which is generally used when that will influence the properties in tests as well. Uh, these blocks which you saw, they were kept in a room. Uh, which had a temperature of 19 degrees Celsius and 55% humidity because these parameters really matter in terms of uh, strength development and water resistance of these blocks. And after uh, they were dried, I dried them for 14 days. Uh, I used uh, 3 samples each for different tests, uh, strength tests and there are 2 set of water resistance tests. I won't talk about compressive strength or strength today because it's again a wider topic today I am going to talk about water resistance which is more interesting but just to give you an idea here you see a, a big, like a range of strength and what you see there is the building code requirement or entropy 2 hours it starts disintegrating so that, this clearly shows that what, uh, cowling improves the water resistance and by doing the other test which was accelerated erosion test we found it's 500 times In different uh, tests will give you different results so but it does improve water resistance but adding cowden uh, into soil has, that's something which has been happening for many many years it's nothing new but the new interesting thing for us was to figure out what makes cowden water resistant so which component is actually responsible for making it water resistant so what I did, I took cow dung and tried to separate it into different components. Here you can see fibers, you see a relatively a relative mass of fibers and the other particles but I extracted the fiber and whatever remains which is the liquid which also smells very bad that's liquid that we separated again into something called SSMA and MSMA. SSMA means small sized microbial aggregates. So that's SSMA and um, MSMA is medium sized microbial aggregate. Won't go into details of this because we will see uh, what these individual components uh, does to the soil flow. Okay, so again coming to the plot uh, which is made through emergent test. Uh, you can see that adding fiber in soil does not improve the water resistance which so far was one of the key reasons people use that okay there are fibers in cow dung and that's why the wall is more water resistant. We found this is not true. What is actually contributing is SSMA. So small size microbial aggregate just adding those improve the water resistance and entirely basically they are completely responsible for water resistance. Uh, you see 0.68 percentage that really represent that only one third of cow dung is SSMA uh, roughly and that is uh, so basically as the whole cow dung, two third of it is not useful for water resistance. It's only one third of the material which is required to make a water resistant first. Uh, I will briefly go through the properties of this material. 
Uh, we did quite some tests, physical tests, chemical tests, and here you can see we found it's a negatively charged material. We also did some tests with forcing mercury into the sample to look at microstructure. Found that that these uh, cow dung are not clogging the soil. Uh, so generally, if you add something, it will clog the soil and water will move slowly. But this was not the case. Uh, some electron microscopy also showed us that there are particles of 1 to micrometer, so very tiny particles. And there is also a magnesium, phosphorus, uh, these kind of uh, elements found in this, which also indicates that these can be the outer cell walls of dead bacteria, which we are dealing with. Uh, while you add with sand, it bridges the two sand particles and form a very water resistant bond. Uh, it also has a low surface area, means it is sort of a spherical material, which we also saw in the picture, and it is rich in fatty acids, so it say, shares quite some similarity with butter, uh, which is also rich in fatty acid. And this is the most interesting part, and as you must have guessed, it's a hydrophobic material, but I want to show you this video. This is cow dung powder, uh, SSMA powder, and you can see it really repels the water. It's quite hydrophobic. Uh, so this is the material which is responsible for water resistance of cow dung and it's extremely hydrophobic. This is a better image of the water droplet and you can see that the water droplet actually makes, uh, yeah, it does not enter the material. Uh, just to give you an idea, cow dung except fiber is like a cocktail uh, which has over 150 plus compounds. And these compounds, are majority of them are fatty acids and uh, I have just mentioned some of the compounds or chemicals which are found and they are responsible for certain property and that's why cow dung has a smell. People say it is antibacterial because it has some acetic acid and this material which is for me difficult to pronounce is super hydrophobic because it is used at industrial scale to make super hydrophobic material. So I must say cow dung has so many interesting compounds, so many properties that uh, it still boggles me that uh, there is so much to explore here. Uh, I will come to the practical application because that is generally very important because we are talking about affordable housing as well. And now I will answer some questions. So is it better to use dry cow dung and or fresh cow dung? Uh, Fresh cow dung means the cow dung has collected but it has not dried. It might happen that you have stored this cow dung for 20 days but still it is in liquid uh, state. So that is fresh cow dung and you can see that fresh cow dung works well but dry cow dung does not. And most people are actually using dry cow dung because the traditional knowledge of using wet cow dung has gone. And this actually gave us an idea, okay, some structures are not working because they have used dry cow dung. Uh, as I mentioned, it's only one third of cow dung, SSMA particle which gives water resistance. So basically reducing the fibers, will it help? And you can see that if you just remove the fibers out of this material, it improves in water resistance. If you add too much of these particles, it does not improve the water resistance. And because it is a function of soil, so it depends on the soil that if you should add more of this material or not. Uh, how to ensure that the consistent quality because you want to make bricks which are quite consistent. These are four different batches from the same farm and more or less these materials are behaving similarly. It's also because it's a semi-automated farm and you might also ask is it working in Netherlands, will it work in India? The, my answer would be uh, it will because we have seen many cases in India where people have used this material. I also made some samples in India which were even better than the samples made there and we did it with two three different cows or cow dung and the reason is because it's the bacteria, the gut bacteria, which matters more than the food the food governs the type of bacteria you have in your stomach but the gut bacteria, all cows will have those and it will come with the dung and that is the part which has the water resistant or hydrophobic property can this result be generalized for any soil in the world? Because uh, every 5 meter the soil will change. Yeah, it's very, it's not a material which is uniform. So just to test this uh, hypothesis, I tried using some of the clay minerals which are more or less standard uh, with sand, which is again a standard material. So we understand these two materials and added cow dung in it. And you can see that uh, with some minerals, uh, 
it improves the water resistance. Uh, so you can see in this case, kaolinite, which is a mineral which does not swell. Uh, so it's uh, more of a water stable mineral. Uh, and there we could even go for over two days of immersion. And if you remove clay out of the whole equation, which brings us to the sand castle, uh, but the sand castle is with cow dung, it is quite water resistant. So it again increases in water resistance. And if you take out the fibers as well, which is just SSMA, you eventually have a material which is uh, infinitely water resistant, means it will not disintegrate in water. It will eventually, but over the period of 10 days or 20 days, it was quite water stable. But you have to be careful that I am talking about water resistance. What about strength? In case of sand, you don't get enough strength. So you don't, can't use it for practical purposes. But from experimental point of view, we got to know that it's the clay which are actually responsible for deterioration of these blocks. And by choosing the right type of clay, you can make your blocks much better. Uh, is it reusable? I, I use the same, uh, the I would say, the uh, the deteriorated sample, I again uh, made a block out of it and you can see that you can reuse it but it will not have the same performance or property, it will reduce. Uh, this is, is it better than lime and cement which are the most commonly used uh, stabilizer in the construction, urban construction and you can see it is performing better than lime and cement. But the trick here is that I am comparing it with 2% of cement and lime. But when you have more, like 5% of cement and lime, cement and lime will be doing much better and that will be stable in water. But good to know that cow dung at certain proportion is much better than cement and lime. So, what makes cow dung so good? One, it is available in significant amount. It's very simple processing, cow dung plus soil compact it and you have to dry these blocks. Very simple. You can also store the mix of cow dung and soil for a long time. And by long time I mean we have done it for two years. So you take cow dung, soil, mix it, it's a wet mix. Wet mix means it can get some fungus, right, if you store it for a long time. But in case of cow dung it does not happen. You can actually store the mix. You might get some fungus that will disappear, but then you can store this mix for two years, three years, as long as you want. So you don't have to uh, make a house right away. You can store it and then make houses later. Also, it does not smell at all. You can get rid of the smell completely from the wet mix itself. Generally, people say when the block dries, it does not smell, which is true. But when it rains, start smelling. In this case, we got rid of smell by doing very simple process, just covering the cow dung soil mix and leaving it for two days. Thanks to COVID, that happened. I was not doing it, but because of COVID, I had to do that and I saw that after two days, the smell was entirely gone. It's 100% natural and circular, so again, uh, it's good for, I would say, environment. And you can crush these blocks and use it as a fertilizer or throw it in your garden and yeah, it's, it's good to go there. Uh, and now I will talk about upscaling. Generally, and also my research was restricted to that point, which is a block of 4 into 4 centimeter, 4, 4, 4 centimeter cube. Uh, most of the time, there is not enough time and funding to upscale it, but luckily I got some funding to just try it out if it can work in the Dutch context or in Netherlands. So we upscaled from these small blocks into these bigger blocks. So this was upscaling. Uh, I will go quite quickly through that because it's just the uh, scaling of the processes I mentioned. Uh, we were given this structure. As you can see, it's a frame structure made up of concrete. It's located in a place called the Green Village at Theodel, which is a space where you can do experiments with building materials and different kind of materials because building code and building laws do not apply there. So it's a special place to try out all the innovations. So we were given the space, it is again two projects running on it and we had to use these bricks to make a wall and see how it behaves in long term. This is me with 1000 kilos of cow dung and you can see it was quite a messy affair uh, but it was quite fun and uh, yeah I can't, I don't have words for it but uh, let me show you a bit. Six thousand kgs of soil with about 1000 kg of fresh cow dung in batches. Was 
last one. Not registered. 
which is called Cool Bricks, and this Cool Bricks became quite popular, I would say, in Netherlands, not that much in India yet, but, uh, and we also got, uh, we, we also got awarded for it, and that led to quite some publicity and interest towards these materials in general, which was quite positive, uh, but, but, oh, oh, sorry. But what happened, as I mentioned, I am not working in this project anymore. Uh, it's also something I want to share. As an academic, you are generally more ethical or you feel that you are more ethical and you don't want to do too much of marketing. Whereas someone who is, has experience of marketing and sales, these people, they are generally very much open. They can say some values or some figures which are generally not realistic but the future I would say forecast of how your material will develop. So in that case, it's sometimes very difficult to work with academic people like me, and uh, because I don't want to say something which is not true, because you want to be scientifically correct. And these differences made me realize that I want to do some. I want to pursue a different direction. And also, I want to do something in India because I don't live in Uganda, and you have to be physically present to make these houses because it's a material which you have to feel. You cannot work on it remotely. So I left that startup and now I'm having my own, I would say, my consultancy and I'm actually exploring, looking for different projects. But one interesting thing which happened uh, by just talking like this in one of the places that I got a fellowship called Materials Future Fellowship. It's in Goa and that's where I live. And uh, now what we do is, uh, it's only part time, but what we do is look at the intersection of food science and law and culture. So we study these and it's an open exploration. So tomorrow if I feel like I want to do something with mud construction, I can explore it. So it's a very open thing. It's a very, I would say it's a really nice fellowship which is open and I'm working on it and enjoying a lot. It's also very different than my thesis. I love food and relates to food so I really enjoy it. Uh, yeah, that was it. These are my supervisors. I must say I did this work in four different departments. So basically supervisors from four different departments. None of them were related to earth construction. So in that way it was the first thesis project. Uh, so this was the first project on this topic at a PhD level. Uh, and I also collaborated with many, many people. Uh, independent of supervisors, so had quite some freedom as well and also collaborated with ISC Bangalore. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you for listening to my talk and yeah, looking forward to the questions. question that you probably not asked. What was the start of this journey for you? I mean, you told us about your degrees and all that, but what got you interested in working with this? Is it friends? Was it some experience? So just a little genesis of your journey into working with mud and counter at all to begin with. Okay. So it starts with my master thesis where I was always interested in working with materials in general. Materials Oh, I forgot to tell you a very important thing. Ah, Actually, that's nice. Huh? Uh, during that's what my, we were looking for. Yes. Yeah, during my bachelor's, I got KBPY fellowship and I did three projects at IIT Bombay. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, I am in that way familiar with IIT Bombay. And that time, I worked with Professor Jangit and I worked on concrete. So, that was my introduction to building materials. In my master's thesis, I decided to work on building materials but then not using any cement. So I made a material and it's inspired from Spider-Man 3 movie, oh. which is a, I think a talk for another day. Uh, and that is named as corn cream, corn cream, because it's made from cornstarch. And that material was my introduction to bio-based material. And this concrete eventually became earthen material. And cow dung is basically just traveling and finding that many people use cow dung. So this is the genesis here. From concrete material to more natural material. IIT Bombay, Spider Man, and Com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, uh, so yeah, I had a fascinating talk at, at various levels. I mean, about construction, about research method, about his own journey. So, yeah, any questions? We started always with our first years. 
that to usual suspects. So hello, I am Ayadi. I am a first year master's student and also an architect. Um, I have two and a half questions for you. Um, so the first one is because it's uh, the research is majorly in Netherlands and we know that they have a lot more cow dung than they can actually use. Would you say that it's more susceptible to be used by the people of Netherlands, the material that you build them in India? Uh, yeah, in terms of feasibility of upscaling, it's very easy in Netherlands. The only restriction at this moment is that they don't have a building code for construction. So then you need a special permission. Uh, but this is gaining popularity mainly because cow dung is a waste in Netherlands. It's not so much of a waste in India. Exactly. And uh, I think that relates to the second question I wanted to ask is there are a lot of architectural and engineering firms that are now working in the space of mud but it is ha it's still largely been unaffordable. The divide that we see now is that the again as you showed the rural people want to not stay in mud anymore and the rich who can afford sustainability in a sense they are the ones who are like yes I want mud, yes I want these things. Um, so again to bridge a gap have you also tested this with things like inert soil or, or uh, something very similar to uh, things that are again being wasted out so that it becomes more affordable for the people in the middle who these firms and these ideas don't really reach to. Okay, so most of the firms which are selling houses to various clients which also in a way makes sense because everyone wants to earn money and you cannot earn money by at this point which is true because I was also of that ideology you know you should make houses for people who cannot afford but there is also a way that you can, I, I should say See, the aspirations are always governed by other people. So people in rural areas, as Thara mentioned, they want to be like urban people, right? Who are, let's assume they are much more rich. So basically when all the rich people start building with mud, the image of mud will eventually increase. It's a hundred years project but it will happen. So I do see it as a positive thing. Secondly, it is expensive because of the architects involved and the experts involved. Tomorrow if I am involved in a project, I would like to charge some money because I need to do that and that makes the project more uh, complicated or more expensive. It can be done at a cheaper price but then you cannot cut short of quality in our buildings. You can do it in concrete but it's very strong. A little bit of corruption here and there could work and you have seen that. But with my construction, just a little, so uh, in Bangalore I see they did quite some research on it, the government approved it and they made houses from mud but they gave this contract to government or, and a government entity. When they made these houses two years after it was uh, uh, it started disintegrating and people don't live there anymore and it was done affordably. It's just that you know it's not the experienced people, the experience costs money. So I feel if government is ready to pay or someone is ready to pay, a rich person is ready to pay money to make hundred houses, it can be done, but it's mainly the financial part which is the personal cost, not the material cost. Material cost in this case is not much. And uh, again, because, so the very first example that comes for uh, mud housing and larger structures over an area for habitation was by the UNWRA for Gaza. And organizations like these can usually afford because this is a more sustainable technology. But in the end, the cost is the only thing that really cuts short. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, but again, my last question is on. Uh, yeah, okay. The last question is uh, yes. Uh, the last question is about the resistance of these kind of materials and technology in terms of. You showed about rain already. That's something that we were debating about as well. How much water resistance can it actually be because of the flash floods, rains, etc., and things like climate change, where again weather is changing. Because these things, for example, to help is also in our very cold centric climate. What would you say is its resistivity to, for example, the temperature drops or temperature again gains? Or just climate change. Uh, flooding is a major problem for this material. You cannot have it uh, under water because, as you saw in my pictures, two three hours of flooding immersion will disintegrate this material, and that's why with much construction you have to design the structure very well. And uh, so I would say. Uh, if you want to make a house which should survive flood, the top, I would say even 1 meter or uh, the bottom 1 meter should be made with uh, mud blocks which has cement in it and the rest of the part I can do it with powder. Uh, that's much more sensible. Also have overhang, long overhang and a proper foundation. So then it is really architecture which saves the material in that way. And that's always been our construction and most people in our construction are architects. There are hardly any engineers or material people.
Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, my name is Vishnu Priya. I am a second year PhD at Sitara. So, um, I had a few clarification. I just wanted to ask you one small thing. I have a lot of questions, but I'll only do it. Yeah. So, uh, maybe, yeah, I'll do it. Email ID, but I will also be here after four or five. Sure. So, these blocks, you uh, tested them inside an infill frame. So, I'm guessing, uh, as far as I've seen the Cowden blocks in India, they are non load bearing, they are very light in weight. So, I'm guessing they are non load bearing. These ones for, uh, so again, where I'm constructing, if I'm constructing this house uh, in rural area, you can use it as a load bearing structure. To give you an example, the house I showed in Leon. Uh, or the structure I showed in Leon has a strength of less than one megapascal, but it is load bearing. Which so, uh, that, that's the mud blocks. Yeah. I'm asking specifically. Yes, mud blocks. Yeah, uh, we are able to beat the specification. Yeah. CACB definitely. Yeah. I'm asking about the cowden blocks. That the cowden block uh, is mud block. It has only two percent cowden eventually. So, so how, questions, sorry. how is the compressed? No, uh, the thing is CACB in comparison. In comparison to a CACB block without anything, it will have the same strength. Then. So CACD we can make without freight G plus that has been, uh, that's what we do, yeah, Yeah. So uh, with 5% cement. Okay, in this case you you have to, so with 5% cement will have a higher strength than this, yes. I would say 50% uh, more strength and the water resistance will be much more better. In this case it can still be used for load bearing structure because people have used it for load bearing structure. Maybe I would say with this specific soil and all too close. But so again, it's, it's need calculation and also the thickness of wall. I can actually go like Shibam, the thickness yeah. of wall is 1.5 meter. Yeah, that is yeah. it. Uh, mud is definitely yeah. based on the design. Uh, so, majorly the questions have uh, been addressed by her. Just I wanted to ask about how do you, like, uh, we started with the whole, uh, the paper on the, not, the image of mud not being accepted. So, I'm just curious to know, okay, from there, how after the travel, how you arranged, uh, you know, came back upon a cow duck mud block because I, I do work with mud and I do work in rural areas and I definitely agree with you that the image is a big issue. Uh, CSEB uh, caters to it a little bit because they think it's uh, similar and we can prove the strength to them. But uh, how do you, how did you arrive at cow duck brick as a suitable solution for this image issue? Uh, my answer is very simple. I was just I am actually more of a material person. Uh, obviously, there is an overarching uh, good that is for affordable housing, but my real interest is material science and understanding structure, uh, materials at micro scale. So, Cowden was not explored before, and I, I know that it is available. I can arrange it in my lab. Very simple logical reasons to choose Cowden. And also, as I mentioned, there was no studies on it, and I have seen it as Cowden. Other materials, also, again, I actually started with 5 10 different materials before, uh, but I didn't make it to my PhD because eventually I decided to just stick with powder. I had other materials as well. I tried other kind of stabilizer, jaggery, sugar, all those kind of things before. And I found that in all the cases, the science is very complicated to understand because you are mixing lime with jaggery with soil, which are three different complex systems. This was two systems, which was much more easy, but just see. Only one type of sample, two percent cowden, had so many variables. So, uh, so do you think these blocks will be accepted and the image value issue can be addressed by uh, media? So, if I let's talk about short term, short time frame, it has a, it will have the same image of uh, CACB. Although people who trust cowden, uh, I would say at this moment politics cowden is very interrelated. So, if, uh, if the government supports use of cowden, so it's much more acceptable for government to use because of cowden, not because of the mud. So, cowden has a better acceptability, but short term people in rural area might still have the same thing. Long term, the idea is that anyone who is able to use it, like rich people, and increase the acceptance of earth over 100 to 100 years is a better, is a more realistic scenario. So, have you also tried to work out the cost uh, because it's supposed to be cost effective? Because in mud, in from my very little experience, uh, like you were explaining to her, 
uh, when we actually, I feel most of the material cost does not exist, yeah, but it is for the labor. Right. So the machine that you showed is very similar to the compressor, uh, CACD machine yeah. or impress or uh, yeah. Martini. So uh, in this machine, that is completely automated, but in India it costs around 35 lakhs. I don't know what okay. is, okay. yeah. Okay. So we use manual machines which is one lakh. <laughs> And in that you can make just 300, 200 to 300 blocks per day because a man has to stand and put it. So they charge a lot more. Right. So uh, 800 rupees per person. Okay. And you need like 5 people to make the blocks. Yeah. And the costs do not work out. Good. So I'm just curious if you had any time to work on the low cost aspect. Actually I didn't. I, as I mentioned I actually was quite fixated on the small sample and the brick. So my all calculations were related to that and more on the technical side. Although it's an affordable uh, project, the pro idea was to make affordable house. The cost comparisons are in relation to cement stabilized CCI, not in relation to any other thing. And there, I didn't make this calculation, my, uh, the toolbits team did, and they found that it can be 80% cheaper in Uganda. But again, very roughly calculated, and I won't trust the values at once. Yeah, Ms. Gaurav, I am a second year PhD student at Sitara. Uh, actually, I have a like, few more questions, but Vishnu Pia has already covered most of them. Uh, so, just one thing like, uh, let's say the normal topsoil, it may have kind of humus content. And uh, uh, like, is, is there any study like, you know, what happens to that humus portion of the soil when it uh, com comes in contact of the microbial mass of the uh, cow dung? Uh, and second uh, question, uh, as uh, she was talking about, it, it seems uh, like low tech at the material and high tech at the process of uh, manufacturing. So, like how, again, I think you have already uh, thought, yeah. So, like how this compression aspect can be, you know, uh, uh, what what can substitute that, like at the, let's like, say, very, at very local uh, rural level? Uh, I will start with second question because I forgot the first one. Uh, <laughs> But uh, to give you an answer, the machine we used in Netherlands is the one which was available in Netherlands and that is a high-tech machine. In India, people use CCB press, uh, that's considered low-tech, but again, is always a relative, uh, is it relatively low-tech or not. That's the machine which people use and there are also, uh, like this machine is available for 2-3 lakhs rupees, although it requires much more labor. Uh, so these are the low tech options and people actually have made uh, affordable houses where they did the calculation as well as compared to concrete building or fire building, uh, building using cement and there they found that it can be 20% cheaper. I think there is also the, in uh, Bangalore ISC campus, the center of sustainable technology is made from CSCP where they did this calculation and they use the same low tech uh, manual press. And, uh, the labor cost costs are not too high in India, 800 is high. Just to give you an example, the wall uh, demonstration a mason made for us for one hour, it took 15,000 rupees. Uh, that could be the price for someone who is so experienced. Uh, so, in that way, 800 per day is uh, it's a, it's a decent price. But I don't mean to say that, you know, it is very cheap. It will be... Uh, will be relatively cheaper to a cement stabilized block as long as you have the sufficient quantity of cow dung. That's very important. So it's always a related comparison. I cannot have an I, I don't know much about the absolute comparison with fire bricks and all. Uh, but with cement it will be much cheaper. Same. So you can store the same material for a long time. You use the same material because then everything is uh, 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 reusable. Otherwise, you people use cement uh, there, and then then it's a, it's a difficult composite and want it to keep the life cycle the same material for. Yeah. So about yeah. So about topsoil. Uh, generally, for earth buildings, you don't use topsoil. It's very much like a, I would say, I would say it's a guideline to use the soil which is probably like one meter below the ground. The soil I use is coming from a tunneling project in Netherlands. So it's really 
people now. Uh, there is regulations and there are again different countries, different rules about you know, how much hummus you can have in your uh, hummus you can have in your soil. So there's I went to the food site, <laughs> but uh, 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 it's almost dinner time, so why not? <laughs> but uh, there is regulation that it can be roughly maybe you know, 0.5% or you should have none at all. But generally don't use top soil, that's the uh, like the first rule of Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask, yeah, uh, I'm Yashishri, first year PhD student at Sadara. So uh, my question was that uh, you spoke about the hydrophobic, uh, the material that is causing it to be hydrophobic. Uh, can it be isolated? So for instance, if we want to 3D print the bricks, can it be isolated and mixed and then used in that technique? Uh, and also can it be mixed with other materials in terms of improving, for instance, say pulp? Can, can it be used for that purpose as well? Okay. So starting with point one, which is this... Uh, so I was able to separate to a level of SSMA. Uh, and that was done in lab. So in reality, if I want to do a low scale, I can just separate or take the fibers out and then still have this liquid. You, you, then I will need very advanced equipment to separate these compounds, which is very difficult. But and also that's something interesting for researchers because that was one, the end of my part. But there comes the whole chemical engineering which can uh, basically study this cocktail and probably isolate the most uh, interesting hydrophobic material out of it and then use it or sell it. Like we also try doing, uh, you know, condensing powder so that it can be sold in bottles or something like that. We also had very small experiments on that to basically make this SSMA more concentrated. But again, uh, it's, uh, it's an open exploration so it can be done, maybe not, but that needs research. Uh, second question was... Uh, about the using other materials. Uh, there is a possibility to use other material, uh, but the problem I think personally would be smell because somehow, and that is also a topic for research, somehow with clay the smell actually is gone after two days. With paper I don't think the smell is gone because paper will absorb the smell. So as long as you are okay with smell, it can work out actually. But, uh, and I am pretty sure there can be other applications. Just this chemical, if you are able to sell it and use it in as an admixture, uh, there are infinite applications. But uh, paper won't work, starch won't work. That's what I can think of. Now, in terms of the acceptability or my acceptability, I am not talking about general, but it's only, like, because at this moment I can only review like what I will like or not. So, more from that perspective. Okay, maybe one more question, anything? Yeah, Charu. So, at the outset, uh, very good work. Can I introduce yourself first? Yeah. So, I am a faculty at Sitara and I look at uh, the infrastructure construction development. And uh, my area of work is mostly concentrated to bamboo as well as some uh, local area. So, in that perspective, uh, the work is really very And uh, uh, I have quite a few questions, but I think Pankaj is out for two. No, we have time. So, uh, could you figure out what is, could you figure out what is the binding agent? Right? So, cow dung as a whole, you have separated into uh, medium, small, as well as fibers. Right? So, fibers are definitely not binding. The other two materials, uh, yeah. out of that, what is the actual binding agent? Like in the clay, you figure out that clay is the binding agent. Yeah. Right? In the required particles. So, uh, what is that binding agent in this which is resulting into, you know, uh, I mean two things. Like one is the binding agent and second is the moisture content. Uh, could you throw some light on uh, With the binding agent, we went to the depth of SSMA. So, we found out that SSMA. So, in, at the block level, uh, adding cow dung does not improve strength, I must say. So, uh, basically clay still governs the whole strength from the binding point of view. So, clay is still the binder in this block. Cow dung is not the strength giving binder, 
it is a binder for water resistance. So it's basically just improving water resistance without increasing the strength. That's one thing about cow dung. Uh, so in that way, I also showed a picture of two cell grains connected through this material where the maximum detail we went to is SSMA which is a mix of fatty acids. So my answer would be it's the fatty acid component of cow dung which is acting as a binder. Uh, but it is very weak binder in terms of strength, but very strong in terms of water resistance. And uh, second question is about uh, the uh, load bearing and not load, non load bearing. Right? Uh, what you can see, you are using 30 mm thick brick wall and at around 1 or 2 megapascal strength. Uh, would it, I don't think it could qualify as a, a structural load bearing. Part. So mostly you are using as a non load bearing uh, element in a frame structure. So that is what the application that we are looking for. Uh, in my case, I, it was the circumstance where we got this frame structure and we built in it. Also, uh, we have not, or at least I have not tried any. So the strength of this block, the maximum strength we got was 5, 4.8, 5 megapascal. 5 megapascal is okay to make a ground story, I, you agree, to make a ground story structure. And if it is not sufficient, you can increase the thickness like all the way. Yeah, primarily with the mud walls, you will have to go to 18 inches. Uh, rather true, than, true, uh, true. But, uh, inches. but uh, for example, uh, again building codes, uh, the engagement says 3.5 megapascal with the cement one, uh, above which you can actually use it as a load bearing uh, block. Uh, and in countries like Switzerland, which is a classic example, 2 megapascal still qualifies for. You can use